All right, class, welcome back. We got cut off um, by the software. It has a 15-minute time limit, which is good because it breaks it up a bit. Anyway, like we are talking about with Gogon, we have the red and green as the primary, but I mean primary, the two main hues that are used throughout this. And a lot of the neutrals are made by mixing them together, but also, of course, adding white to the red to create the pinks. And then he adds in yellow, of course, and other colors. But... The, the overall theme of it is using a color theme or color story is using green and red throughout the piece. And that's just an example of the use of complementary colors in this way. This is another one using red and green by Degas. He has a whole series of pieces with ball, ballerinas and ballet dancers from behind the scenes. And again, using them primarily using red and green as the palette throughout this. Of course there's orange, yellows, but you can see how he's making um, complex colors by mixing these colors that are opposite, complementary on the color wheel. Another term we want to use sometimes is intensity or saturation and chroma. They're all the same definition basically. People talk about this, the intensity of the color meaning to how clean or bright or in terms of paint, how straight out of the tube it is, because when it comes out of the tube, that's as clean or bright as it can be, versus dirty or muddy looking colors, or when you get when you mix certain things together, they start to get muddy. If you mix the opposite color, you can get neutrals that way. But also, if you mix a green that has a warmer undertone to it with a green that has a red that has a cooler undertone to it, it would do something different. If you have mix a yellow with a cool undertone, with a red with a warm undertone, it will make it a muddier version of orange. See, this is what we're talking about. So you have to really play with the paint a bit to see what happens. A nice way to organize your color story or to make things feel like they belong together you know, as a whole, but not get everything to be just two colors or the same, is to have an associated color palette. So yellow and blue make green. They are associated, but not next to each other, right? Green and blue. Green is yellow and blue, so they're associated in a triad. If you use them together in a piece, they'll be automatically creating things that make sense together, but have quite a lot of variety. So that's like using an associated color palette. Another way you could do this, which is a little more straightforward to understand, is analogous colors in varying degrees. So that would be, you can change the amount of the two colors in it, but they're analogous because they're side by side on the color wheel. So we have yellow all the way to different types of oranges. They're all made with red and yellow, but they're side by side on the color wheel. That would create this type of a painting if you did analogous colors, where you would be adding in the purple. But these are the four colors that are analogous to each other, so they automatically create a sort of unity. And then you, there's adding some yellow into this, so that would be up here too, to create a more visual interest. But they're analogous, they're on the color wheel in the same direction, side by side. So those are just a few ways. There's a lot of other ways you could organize your palette. The main thing is to think about mi mixing your neutrals instead of just using a uh, brown that's from a tube of paint. And to pay attention to using like the undertone of colors that work with each other. So not using five, five different types of blue, but using one blue and a yellow that works with it to get your test out some of your colors on swatches, for example, if you want to make greens. Don't just buy green, but mix a green with the two other blues you're going to do. So value is how we see texture. We could say light and dark and the way it hits is absorbed by objects or creates little shadows and things. And But it also could be actual texture. This is an example of a painting made directly with applying fingerprints. Chuck Close is the artist. He created this piece by putting his oil his hand into oil paint and then one by one creating them on the canvas to show a feeling of depth but also actual fingerprints. You say, well, why bother doing this? Well, this is like a conceptual reason for using his fingerprint and the texture it creates because fingerprints are connected to identity, right? We all have our individual ones. Um, and he is making a picture of 
his wife's grandmother, someone in his family, and connected to him in some way, and so he's using the idea of individuality of his connection to her to be part of the idea and the actual texture of the project. So it's a very interesting way of dealing with texture. You can see texture in really simple ways. A kid probably may have put a piece of paper over something like wood or the sidewalk or tree bark and just rubbed it with a pencil or a crayon and that would be a very simple way to get texture on something called a rubbing. Um, that would be actual texture, picking up the actual texture of it. When you're working with your paper and paint, you're going to want to pay attention to the automatic texture of the drawing surface. The paper already has a certain type of texture and how you apply the pigment with what you apply it with is going to already be dealing with something that's already there. So you want to think about are you using, um, some of you are using thicker drained paper and some of you are using smoother paper. So just pay attention to that when, you, when you're picking what you're going to do, what kind of paper you're using. Now a lot of it's going to be happening through the brush. On a lot of paintings it's happening on canvas and canvas has a texture as well. And the way you apply the paint onto the paper that you're going to be making your projects with is going to affect the feeling of it. What I'm talking about is the direction of your strokes, where they move, if you kind of scrub into them or if it's a heavier, thicker paint, um, and where you, which way your uh, your brush is trailing when you're putting it onto the paper or the canvas. If you're trailing off or if you're pushing harder than trailing off, it'll all feel like part of the intentionality to it. So even strokes, gradated color, when you overlap your strokes, when you do more of a linear stroke or you vary the line weight, that thick and thin, these are all part of the texture. And this just shows you another slide to show what I'm talking about with the direction of the brush or the stroke. If it's other type of drawing material, it's going to affect the feeling of it. So you want to pay attention to that. The direction that you're applying the paint is going to add to the feeling of your piece. You kind of been doing this already in your other projects with line when you were doing hatching and cross hatching. That was actually dealing with the line direction and that was affecting the tone and the value in your pieces, yes, but also it gave it a sort of texture and you know. In a way, we want to try to use those sort of textures to match the object. So the direction of the stroke makes sense for the object. So the texture doesn't feel like it's fighting with what you're doing. You want, like they did in this painting with the waves, they, they're they applying it in a way that a wave would work, the way a wave would move, so that it feels more natural. Another way you could do it is called stippling, where you're doing kind of dashes or dots. And a lot of impressionist painters, this is Monet with his haystacks, use a lot of stippling because they're trying to capture the light and the texture very quickly in, in outdoors in plain air. You could do this by pressing things into the paper. You'll see in some of my student examples later that they use things like saran wrap and paper towels to um, have a texture to it by creating texture, by pressing things onto it, picking up some of the paint and putting it down. Another way is having white of the paper coming through, this is called dry brushing, where the paintbrush isn't totally saturated, but you kind of have it slightly dry. It still has paint on it, but you move it and it creates some of the white of the paper. It shows more of a paper texture or scumbling which is when you brush um, over darker paint. It happens a lot in oil painting. It's called scumbling. These are some examples of student products. I'm going to be doing some videos with um, some of these making some color swatches but to try to help you understand it. But nonetheless, let's do this. And this will hopefully explain to you how you're supposed to do the project. Your project is going to be by making swatches of color, like you're making your own fabric but on paper, and then you're cutting it out and collaging it to create an image. So they have the whole background painted this way, and then they made green sheets of paper with texture on them, like you did with your um, 
kind of like value, but you have them and then you cut them out and they made this whole thing with these colors. They could pick any number of colors, but each shape or swatch can only be green. It can have light and dark green on it, but it couldn't have pink inside of it. That's what I'm talking about in the rules of the project. This one's really cool. Um, they did a lot of splattering. It's kind of slightly breaking the rules here with the red into the orange, but if it was the color that they made it with, like this one shows it very clearly, it's pink, and then they made it kind of duller. It's all the color they made it white, pink, and then the red that they made the pink in. This is a really beautiful example of that. They're using texture. So it's going to be sort of more like a quilt, and I talk about, you know, stained glass. It's not because you should outline it. It's because stained glasses use a shape of color, just like you're doing a shape of value. You're doing a shape of color this time. This person used a comb to do this, and I was going to show you some of the video that I make of this. They went back and forth with the paint and a comb to create that pattern. And then this is what happens if you use saran wrap and create it with that type of a texture. Let's stay on that for just a second longer. Just see how the intricacy, they're using all reds, like these are reds with black added with a little white showing on the paper. It's all mostly the same red. This one has a lot of pink and it's greens, but it's not like a really complex color, but because they use the tints and the tones of things, it makes it very interesting. Again, not using a ton of color, but using them effectively here. Um, this one probably could use a little more texture, especially in the white, um, but the yellow doesn't feel like it has much, but you get the idea of some of what I'm talking about effectively and the way the blue is working. It's interesting design playing with the flag and the eagle at the same time. This piece is pretty cool using a limited palette as well, yellow, red, reddish, orange, and blue to create these type of this imagery. And this is all collaged on using a lot of dry brushing and paying attention to the direction of the stroke the brush. This is someone using a paper towel to create that image, that sort of uh, design from a paper towel, and then this is, that little bits are a comb that they use to scrape through it. Very interesting. And this, you can see the collage effects of the small pieces that they put together in it. It adds like a feeling of depth and interest to it, the way they collaged it over the top. So, you can think of this in stained glass, except for I, this, I'm a little bit hesitant to show you because you don't want to outline it, but I'm thinking, I'm trying to talk to you about the idea of having shapes of tones like they do in stained glasses. But maybe a better idea to think about it is like fabric or a quilt, because the whole thing is one tone or pattern, texture, and you sew it together so it doesn't, it's a seamless edge. Well, you're doing your own paper fabrics and glue, cutting them out and gluing them together. So it's like a collage, but you're not using pictures, you're using the paper that you made a certain color and texture to do it. And you could have something that's geometric and it doesn't have to be representational. People seem to get hung up on that, but it needs to be thinking about focal points and the way your eye moves and balance all the things we've been learning this class but i think you can do something really interesting with some geometry it doesn't you know don't have to be representational in all the projects quilts are a really good inspiration so i just put these in you can think about a lot of different things people do you're going to want to create their, your pattern first and your design through the design process and then like you did with the the value one pick where the colors are going to go and then cut them out like I showed you guys in class before with other things, and then glue them down. You might want to paint the entire background so you don't have white paper showing through. So I'm going to do a video showing you guys how to create some texture sheets. Okay, get started, guys. Um, look forward to seeing what you get out of this, and I hope you're all doing well and staying safe out there.